Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another uh, live stream of History Value podcast. Today I'm joined by Pro Professor Bruce Jolton, and today we're going to be discussing what did Jesus really say? Well, welcome back to the show, Bruce. Many thanks. Good to be with you. Great. Let's get started. Um, so how does a historian go through the Gospels and sort out what we can know about the historical Jesus and the things that he said, like basically the methodology of it. I think the basic approach to method in any kind of historical study uh, must be that of taking account of all the best evidence that can be assessed. And in the case of Jesus, that means determining what that best evidence is. Uh, in this case, a consideration not only of the canonical Gospels, but also pseudepigraphal materials on the earlier end. And then taking that evidence and placing it within its appropriate context. Uh, and in the case of Jesus, that appropriate context uh, is as concerns Jesus himself, Second Temple Judaism, and then as concerns the unfolding of the sources about Jesus, uh, both diaspora Judaism uh, and also the culture of the Greco-Roman world of the time. Uh, one has, I think, to set up both evidence and context in any kind of historical study. And then after that point comes the moment of what I would describe as analytic assessment. Uh, and in analytic assessment, you set up the best logical model that you can uh, of what must be the generative earliest point of the evidence, which so influences the rest of the patterns that the whole comes into shape. Uh, in the case of Jesus, uh, the study has to take into account that the evidence at the be very beginning shows no sign of having been directly written down, as it were, stenographically. Rather, part of the context is we need to take account of the development of oral tradition into the written sources that we can see at the moment. And what does that tell us in the sense of um, how does one discern that there was a source like the Q document? Many criticize and say, this is just a hypothetical source. How do we know that it existed? Well, I think the uh, criticism that it is a hypothetical source is in fact cogent. It is hypothetical. There is no document called Q in antiquity. Indeed, all we can say with any kind of certainty about the material we now call Q is that it was not called Q when it was first developed. Uh, the idea of Q truly gained hold uh, during the 19th century, uh, hence its name. The Q is a shortened form of the German term Kvela source. And the reason for it is that if anyone sets up the first three gospels in a synopsis, what is quite plain is that there are approximately 200 verses shared by Matthew and Luke that do not appear in the gospel according to Mark. And so those 200 verses became a likely starting point for asking the question, are we dealing with a source prior to the gospels, which has influenced their development? Uh, it's my opinion that in order to understand this earlier material uh, in its uh, oral force, what one has to do is also be willing to see the way in which much of this material we presently call Q, uh, in fact, overlaps with Mark, uh, so that one cannot simply mechanically determine what Q is by taking a pair of scissors to a synopsis. You have to look at the lay of the evidence and 
interrogated as to how it came into existence. There's a sense in which you can only write uh, any kind of history of Jesus by writing a history of how the tradition about Jesus developed. And the so-called Q is something that features uh, within that evidence. Uh, I myself think that it would be more accurate to think of Q as being an early Mishnah, uh, which had been developed by Jesus' followers in order to take up the challenge of what it meant to follow Jesus in the period after the resurrection. And when do you think that this Q document was put together? I think that uh, Q, because of the way in which it interpenetrates with another major source, a source associated with Simon Peter, likely came to existence at approximately the same time. And that would be around the year 35 of the Common Era. Uh, that is approximately three years subsequent to the resurrection. Uh, the reason that uh, that seems to me a likely date uh, is that we know that as the time when Paul uh, went to Jerusalem to meet uh, those who had been apostles before him, and uh, he there clearly became aware of some of the early traditions which ultimately made their way into the Gospels, which were composed at a later period. But it appears to be the case that a tradition associated with Peter, as well as an oral source of Jesus' sayings that we presently call Q, uh, existed at that time. Could you describe why you associate Q with the Petrine tradition? Oh, I, I would just say that when I said they are associated, I would say only by means of Paul. That is that okay. uh, they, they are associated in the sense that we only know of them both as written down in the Gospels. Uh, however, their other association is that there's an early influence on Paul. Uh, Paul openly speaks about the way in which he met not only with Peter, but also with James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, and Paul also shows a, a particular interest in the issues of sayings of the Lord. Uh, so what we can see is that from an early stage, although these uh, streams of tradition are distinct, uh, each came into existence uh, for its own particular reason, uh, they could be used in association with one another. How many of the sayings in Q do you think Jesus actually said? If it's possible to know. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, a better way to pose the question is how much of Jesus is on the average involved within each saying. Because I think as we look at individual sayings, what we can see rather clearly is that they are subject to interpretation uh, as they were being handed on. Uh, if, if I can give an example of this, it might, it might be helpful. Uh, one of the interests of this Mishnaic source of Jesus' materials is how to deal with the issue of those who are active outside the circle of the followers of Jesus, who nonetheless operate in the name of Jesus. Uh, and with the result of that, we have the story uh, given, I'll give you the form of it in Luke's gospel in chapter nine, of John reporting to Jesus that they had discovered someone who's casting out demons in Jesus' name. And John saying, John the son of Zebedee, that uh, they, he with the other major uh, disciples, prevented him. Jesus tells him not to prevent them. 
uh, and asserts that who's ever not against you is for you. Now, that same vignette uh, also appears in the gospel according to Mark. Uh, and, the, and this, by the way, undermines the notion you will sometimes hear that there's no cue in Mark. There is some. Uh, the same vignette occurs in the gospel according to Mark, but in that gospel, there's a notable addition, and that is Jesus uh, also says, in addition to the statement, who's not against you, it's for you, he also says that no one who does a power, a miracle in my name, will be able quickly to curse me. In other words, what happens is, that a second argument is brought to bear. And this second argument reflects a, a situation in which there is an active movement about to curse Jesus. Well, we know there was such a movement about, but at a later period, uh, as Jesus' movement grew, uh, it attracted opposition. So I would say that you can see in that case an example of how it is that an initial statement of Jesus uh, gathers additional reasoning behind it as a result of the experience of the later church. Uh, so that will frequently occur uh, within material, including material which is quite evidently important uh, within the unfolding of this material. I suppose the clearest example of that uh, would be the Lord's Prayer, because in that case, too, uh, you have clear additions in both Matthew's and Luke's versions, doesn't appear verbatim in Mark, uh, that show that the work of handing on materials orally and using them uh, within communities results in their shaping over a period of time. And why do you think that this document was written in circa 35 AD? Like, why, 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 why was Q put together? What was the point of it? Yeah, it's a good question. I think the year 35 would be a good date of composition. Uh, I myself would not be inclined to think it was written down that early. Uh, as I said earlier, it has the quality of a Mishnah, which was a particular challenge for this movement. It was a challenge for this movement because Jesus, although he was very well known as a rabbi and called that, had died at a younger age than it would have been normal actually to have produced his own Mishnah. Uh, typically, the heritage of a rabbi would be solidified by his putting together material to be memorized. The very term Mishnah means repetition. And the idea was that it would be learned by heart uh, by disciples who in turn uh, would interpret it, extend it, and, you know, in the course of discussion, sometimes counteract it over particular matters that arose in the life of the community. Well, that rather well-established pattern simply couldn't be followed because of the death of Jesus. And I think this is one reason for which, as you were just indicating, uh, there is clearly a significant degree of variety in the way in which Jesus' sayings are handed on. And that indeed has brought about concerns not only in critical discussion, uh, but also among believers as to why there should not be basically stenographic accord among the Gospels concerning what Jesus said. In the nature of the case, that couldn't be so, because his disciples were in the position of having to assemble his teachings as they had known it in order to attempt to sketch their own Mishnah. And this, I think, is what resulted in the distinctive form of this Mishnah that we call Q. It's unlike the earliest narrative type of tradition, 
which we have in the name of Simon Peter. Uh, it isn't designed to tell you the arc of Jesus' story. Uh, instead, it is set up to address especially important topics for those who were following Jesus after the resurrection and promulgating his message. Uh, and that's why we see an emphasis upon the preaching of the kingdom of God, what is said, what kind of parable can be used to convey it, uh, on actions concerning the kingdom of God, uh, on conduct towards others uh, within Israel, because Israel is basically the horizon of the Mishnaic source. Uh, you have sayings that tell people exactly how to travel uh, as being one of the 12, which they understood within their particular form of Mishnah as being practical advice. Uh, they're concerned with the issue of authority, uh, how they know what they do is authorized. Uh, and they also have to deal with the question of how they can know what to do in the absence of Jesus. That is, how his distinctive teaching as a rabbi, his halakha, uh, can be extended uh, in the period of the resurrection. These, to my mind, are the uh, major topics that uh, this Mishnaic source developed. Uh, first of all, uh, orally speaking, and I think in the year 35, uh, it was an oral composition. Uh, the evidence uh, suggests to me that it had clearly already uh, been translated from its original language, from Aramaic uh, into Greek before the writing of the Gospels. Uh, and I would estimate that it was during that period uh, that it also made this important change in medium uh, from an oral composition into a, a written document. What did they think that the resurrection, the, re the resurrection of Jesus was? What led them to the conclusion that he rose from the dead? The Mishnaic source, which I think in this regard uh, is very well represented by the close of the gospel according to Matthew, uh, gives us a very clear sense of what Jesus' resurrection means uh, for them. Uh, within Matthew's presentation, the 11 go to the appointed mountain in Galilee, uh, 11, because now uh, Judas has killed himself, uh, there is very little in this final scene in the gospel according to Matthew by way of incidental description of Jesus. Uh, it simply uh, refers uh, to the disciples encountering Jesus on the mountain and also to there being some significant degree of doubt about their encounter. Uh, it's interesting that even the nature of this doubt is not explored. It is not a scene uh, such as the story of Thomas in the gospel according to John. Uh, instead, there is simply a mention of this doubt. And then the story of the resurrection within Matthew goes on to give uh, Jesus a particular uh, commands to his disciples, which for the close of this gospel is the very point of the resurrection itself. Uh, namely, that they are to teach others to keep and to do what Jesus himself had taught. Uh, the 11, or we could say 12, are designated as performing exactly the tasks that Jesus himself had undertook. Oh, for this Mishnaic source, I think that is the very nature of the resurrection. It's interesting that uh, it is generally the case uh, 
that stories of Jesus' resurrection are not only accounts of encountering Jesus alive after he was dead. Yes, they are, are of course, that, but they aren't only that. Uh, they are also uh, stories that explain what imperative arises out of that encounter, how this is, in fact, part of a divine commission, which involves those who encounter Jesus in acting in new ways. That is also the case at the close of Matthew's gospel. And I would say here, uh, the community of the Mishnaic source is articulating its own particular understanding that Jesus is actually risen within the bringing together of his teaching so that it can be applied afresh. And I want to shift a moment to the uh, back to the Gospel of Mark when you mentioned that it seems to quote material from Q a couple of times. Do you think that Mark knew Q as an oral tradition or did he know him as a written document? Uh, I would say in all probability for Mark, the Mishnaic source is still oral. Uh, and the reason I say that is that he seems to know materials within it without actually citing them. Uh, so for example, Mark quite famously does not give us a version of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and I must say, I, I like this example because it serves not only to illustrate something about Mark, but also to illustrate something about the nature of scholarship. Uh, because there's no Lord's Prayer in Mark, uh, on occasion it has been suggested, oh, well, perhaps, in fact, uh, Jesus never taught the Lord's Prayer. Uh, you know, it, it is an example uh, of what I would consider to be shortcut history that doesn't take the whole range of evidence into account. Because when you consider Mark, although it's quite true, he doesn't give you a scene such as uh, Matthew and Luke do, uh, he does assume uh, when he presents Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus addresses God as Abba, uh, that he prays to Abba concerning what the will of God is, uh, and one of his central concerns is that he not be brought and his disciples not be brought to what he calls the test, uh, conventionally uh, translated temptation, but I think rather weakly translated that way. In other words, sometimes Mark knows very well uh, materials that he doesn't happen to tell us about. Similarly, the actual close of Mark's gospel is that the women who have visited the tomb say nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Well, in ending the gospel that way, Mark is showing you uh, that there is more to be learned uh, in this curriculum for preparing for baptism that he is offering in his own gospel. And why do you think that the author of the Q document decided uh, to leave out the passion narrative or the story of Jesus? Uh, once you decide not on a narrative genre, once that decision is made, and your focus is on the repetition of Jesus' teaching, uh, then your concern becomes uh, how can I develop uh, coherent topics that will permit us not only to remember, uh, but also to understand and to apply this material? In this regard, one might actually just take a look at the Mishnah, uh, which develops in a highly structured way, but it's topical. Uh, it is not developed in a narrative fashion. Uh, its topics in the Mishnah are not only by individual uh, tractates of the Mishnah, but also by books within the Mishnah that aggregate those tractates. Now, 
obviously the mission of Jesus is, isn't anything like as large as the mission. And that's only to be expected because the document we today call the Mishnah is in fact a, a combination of the individual Mishnayot, the individual Mishnahs of specific rabbis, which were woven together over time. Uh, so what we're seeing there is a product probably of around 200 uh, in the common era and of several rabbis, many of whom are actually named uh, inside the Mishnah itself. Another example of what happens when you make the decision that you're not going to deal with narrative, but rather with sayings material, is the gospel according to Thomas. Uh, in Thomas also, uh, there is very little by way of narrative. Sometimes you'll get a slight setting up of a vignette. Uh, I would compare the little story I just referred to earlier of the person who was casting out demons in Jesus' name. That's not in Thomas, but it's the kind of presentation that uh, Thomas will occasionally gives you. But if, if you had to rely on the gospel according to Thomas in order to understand what happened to Jesus instead of what Jesus taught, you would be in serious trouble. Uh, and in all probability, uh, when the gospel according to Thomas was produced, one reason for its production was the knowledge that there were already other gospels about, which would give you a narrative arc. Similarly, in my understanding, uh, Peter is well aware that the 12 have a Mishnah. He's a member of the 12. Uh, and those of the 12 understand that Peter has a particular model of preaching also. And uh, Peter was well known for his activity among, first of all, proselytes, uh, and then eventually actual Gentiles. Uh, so this movement of Peter came about for a particular reason. He had to move into populations where a basic narrative understanding of Jesus did not exist prior to anything that he might say. So that meant that he had to uh, develop the particular challenge of how do you tell the story of Jesus for people who are about to be baptized? <laughs> that's, that's a highly uh, specific purpose, uh, which is described on several occasions uh, in relationship to Simon Peter. And the uh, model of what we would now call a narrative gospel, a, among the gospels we presently have, uh, Marx is probably closest to that model, uh, is produced by those particular concerns. So it doesn't surprise me that uh, gospel according to Mark, probably written in Rome from what we can see, and for the most part for Gentiles, should follow more along the lines of the narrative kind of approach than the model of reproducing and interpreting Jesus' teaching, which we can see elsewhere. And similarly, uh, I think that we can see the, the balance of approaches changing. Uh, and it relates to uh, issues of, is it narrative like Peter's gospel, or uh, is it rather misnaic? as in the case of what we call Q. And then we can also add in other kinds of approach. For example, how much do we feel it is crucial to represent the apocalyptic presentation of Jesus preaching in which he will appear as the son of man in order to judge the world? We can see that very clearly in Mark, in Luke, and in Matthew, but we also see it clearly to differing degrees uh, so that decisions of balance are being made as differing sources are assimilated in order to produce each individual gospel. 
Do you think the Gospel of John is involved involved in this situation? Do you think John could have known Q or had a separate tradition of sayings of Jesus that he knew about? Uh, John's Gospel has been a particular challenge because I would describe it as being the most writerly of the Gospels. I've just been involved in a project in which I translated all of the synoptic gospels together and now i'm just finishing up my first draft of the translation of the gospel according to john and uh two things come through to you very clearly and quickly and they are both reinforced by your work on the gospel according to john overall the one is that there is much less a uh, direct interface with the Hebrew scripture, much less by way of quotation or what we would call citation. Uh, even when scripture is referred to in John, very often when you would expect the scripture to be specifically cited as in the synoptics, it's not in John. So for John's gospel, Hebrew scripture looks as if it is understood to be more in the background than in the foreground. And the other feature of it, because it's so well written, is that it is a series of discursive presentations. That is, sometimes actual discourses of Jesus, in which Jesus is presented as making very well-formed speeches of several paragraphs with a clear theological argument running all the way through. Uh, but in addition to that, that even the narrative material is so presented that it has a discursive force uh, such as you don't see in the Synoptic Gospels. And that results in the, the simple, simple practical problem that you can't break John's gospel down into units uh, with the same facility you can do that with the synoptic gospels. That's one of the signs that it's a work that is written, that it is actively being put together by someone at this stage, I think uh, we can call an author. Now, does this author know what has gone on before? I think there's every reason that we should be open to that question. I mean, even Luke's gospel at the very beginning uh, refers to eyewitnesses and ministers of the word whose work he is bringing together into his, into Luke's volume. Uh, that, by the way, I take to be a very clear indication uh, that Luke knows very well that there are people about who were not only there, but also people functioning as ministers of the word who operate not as eyewitnesses, but rather as ear witnesses, uh, and that their work is being represented in his gospel. Uh, that's why, from my point of view, uh, reading the gospels themselves, the idea of streams of tradition is really not alien. It seems to me to follow through very naturally from an organic reading of the Gospels overall. Now, in the particular case of John, he uh, doesn't give you an introduction in which he talks about earlier sources in the way that Luke does. Instead, John, of course, tells you in the beginning was the word. He wants you to start from the perspective of eternity. He is writing a theological work from beginning to end. And in that, of course, in the opening chapter of the gospel, he is alluding to the story of the creation of the world in Genesis chapter one. And he's putting Christ as logos there at that generative point. Though he doesn't make any citations, uh, his usage of language tells you about Genesis uh, without moving into the direct genre of commentary. 
And as he moves through the prologue, he tells you things about John the Baptist, which as a reader today, you know you have read before. Uh, you know that John as witness, which is how John uh, refers to John the Baptist, that John as witness has already been there in the first three gospels in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. So it does raise the question, does John already know the synoptics? And I would suggest the answer is he, he certainly knows that the synoptic gospels exist, I would say. Uh, this is also reflected at the very end of the gospel when he talks about the many, many volumes that would have to be written if you attempted to record everything that Jesus did and said. That, it seems to me, is a recognition that he knows there are others around. Does he know any of them in particular? I think it is quite possible. Uh, I'm still investigating this, I, so I only say it's possible. I think it's quite possible that he's operating with a specific awareness of Luke's gospel. Uh, and I think that this particularly because of the way John, in comparison to Luke, uh, handles the story of Jesus' passion. But apart from that, I think there's also uh, indication that uh, John is dealing with traditions already reflected in the synoptic gospels, but that have been developed in the interest of innovative interpretations. Uh, so for example, the feeding of the 5,000, though it's synoptic tradition, is subject to quite extraordinary interpretation uh, in which Jesus is himself presented as being the bread of life. Uh, I doubt very much that that occurred uh, simply because John read one of the synoptic gospels, take Luke. Even if that's the case, I think that what's occurred is a different understanding of how this same tradition should be handled, uh, which has influenced John in John's presentation. Similarly, there are elements in John which come out quite distinctively and which uh, clearly are not reliant on the synoptic gospels. For, for example, uh, John's problematic statement that John himself tries to take back uh, that uh, Jesus had been baptizing and making more disciples than John the Baptist had. That is, Jesus himself was presented as a Baptist. Personally, I think that's quite plausible. I think it's plausible that he disciple of John the Baptist's would, in fact, engage himself uh, in a ministry of baptism. But it's quite unlike what's presented in the Synoptic Gospels. And as I say, uh, John itself is uncertain of how to evaluate its own statement. It makes the statement and then it takes it back. That, I think, occurs uh, because John's Gospel is well aware of there being other traditions, not only written, uh, but also oral. Could you provide examples as to why you think John is familiar with Luke's gospel? Well, in the uh, case of the Passion, there is a insistence in, in Luke uh, and in John alone on the familiarity of those who had arrested Jesus within the high priestly party and people in Jesus' entourage. Uh, in John's gospel, that's the disciple whom Jesus loved, not obviously in Luke. But you do have this feature of knowledge of the high priestly operation on the part of Jesus' disciples and vice versa, uh, which brings into focus a possible priestly interest uh, in these gospels 
that we don't have elsewhere, uh, and which uh, also suggests that uh, they have informants that the other Gospels don't share. Well, okay. Um, what about the... Uh, oh, hold on. Spam call on the phone. <laughs> it will do that. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that the Gospel of John was written in stages? I know that some scholars think that. Some think, no, he just wrote the whole thing. Yes, I've just been uh, rereading the uh, commentary by Raymond E. Brown, hmm. which is probably the best known example uh, of the notion of the, the stage development of the gospel according to John. As a matter of approach, uh, I basically agree with that, although I, I think the number of stages that Ray Brown sets out is greater than is really required in order to understand the gospel. Uh, it seems to me that a there's a kind of grounding level of interpretation. Uh, from, and I would suggest that this comes from someone who is not represented in the synoptic tradition uh, and is likely to be the figure known as Apollos in the Acts of the Apostles, whom Paul also mentions. Uh, Apollos is described as being a very talented speaker and as making his arguments out of scripture. Uh, and this comes through very clearly in some of the strong discursive materials uh, in the gospel, according to John. Uh, however, I think that in addition to that, uh, there is also, because Apollos is very much a diaspora figure, uh, and in a way, you know, John's gospel is largely a work targeted on the diaspora. It's, it thinks of this whole movement centered on Jesus already as being separable, if not separated from Judaism. Uh, but in addition to that, you also have this an, a, a area of local knowledge represented by John. I all, already referred to the mention of Jesus himself baptizing. Uh, there are also references to Galilean materials, not least Cana of Galilee, uh, and individuals who are associated with Galilee, such as Philip. Uh, which suggests that we're also dealing with an element that is very concerned uh, with Jesus' emergence as a prophet in Galilee, uh, whose emergence is marked by signs. Uh, so although I myself uh, don't think it's necessary to talk about a complete signs gospel, some scholars have done that, uh, Robert Fortna, who uh, worked down the river from down the Hudson River from me at Vassar College, uh, wrote a very well regarded monograph on the Gospel of Signs. I don't think it establishes that there was a separate such gospel, but I think there was a stream of tradition that presents Jesus in that way. So you have the influence of Apollos, uh, the influence of Philip and uh, similar Galileans. And these, I think, are, are woven uh, into the gospel with other materials, but perhaps what gives it its most distinctive shape is that uh, John's gospel also has a specifically uh, ritual interest. That is, it concerns itself with the issues of how it is you should understand and reproduce uh, Jesus' meals with his disciples, uh, how it is that uh, baptism leads to illumination, uh, what the function of anointing is. Uh, all of these matters are dealt with with a 
innovatively uh, ritual focus in John that is uh, developed all the way through the gospel. So I think when you look at the issue of ritual focus, uh, you probably come nearest to the authorial intent of John in bringing these materials together. Well, thanks for joining me today, Bruce. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.